when this will run, you know, the images will run automatically that you sent, uh -huh. but um, the video will, you'll have to run that from here, stop the PowerPoint and run that. Oh, I told the girls whenever they got tired of my images, just to come up and start the video. Oh, okay. It's just going to rotate and rotate and rotate. Okay. When you think it's done, just have one of the girls come up and start the video. Okay, I'll let them know. I don't think they... They're not ready? Lawrence, inaugural practitioner fellow at the Yale Center for the Study of Race, Indigeneity, and Transnational Migration in 2021. She is currently under contract from the Archives of American Arts Oral History Project to collect art histories of Latino artists, and this is where she began working with Linda Vallejo. As an independent curator, she has put together 20 exhibitions at museums, university galleries, and artist run spaces across the U.S. and Central America and is currently the curator at the Gerald and Stanley Rubin Center for the Visual Arts at the University of Texas, El Paso. We're very happy to have Dr. Investa here tonight in conversation with Lou Vallejo. Thank you for coming, and I will get out of your way now. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. It's really such a pleasure to be here and a privilege, and you did so much to get us here, and I'm really grateful. Thank you. Hey, hey. Yeah. Hello. Good evening. Hi, everybody. Um, I am very happy to see Linda in real life. 
<laughs> we've been corresponding by Zoom for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to say just briefly about kind of our starting conversation, which was mm -hmm. kind of a very intense 12 hours in which I asked Linda everything I could think of about her life and work. Yeah. Um, and that conversation kind of spun into um, a conversation, not just about life and work, but about a, a way of living and a way of working and a way of being in the world. And so I'm hoping that we can touch on some of the things that came through that conversation while we're here together tonight. Mm -hmm. um, I Where would you like to start? Do you have an idea? Um, you said that you had a couple of questions that you still wanted to ask me. And so I thought maybe we could start there on a really personal level, because she does know where all the skeletons are buried. Skeletons, yeah. She knows where all the bodies are buried. So I thought maybe she'd like to ask me something <laughs> that might be embarrassing, but fun for you. <laughs> Pressure's on. Oh, there's a lot of embarrassing stuff, let me tell you. The 60s. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Imagine the worst. <laughs> Um, no, I'm, I'm delighted that, that this museum has brought this body of work. This, so this is 12 years of Linda's work. Um, as she tells me, she's about to shift into a different body of work. So this is in many ways a culmination of these disparate bodies of work that, that are speaking to the same sets of questions. Mm -hmm. And because we have such limited time with you tonight, we can't keep you here for 12 hours. That would be <laughs> um, unkind of us. I, I wanted to start actually with what Brown is. And so I know we have cute anecdotes that we'll share, but but I think the biggest question is kind of what what is it to think about Brown? What is Brown? What does it mean to be browned mm -hmm. by the world? And so um, Mary has also kindly commissioned me to write an essay for this new catalog. And I've done the most obvious thing you can do if you work in Latino Chicano studies, which is write about Jose Esteban Munoz and the sense of Brown mm -hmm. as a text for thinking about Linda's work, which surprisingly has not been done yet. And so if you don't have this text yet, I hope you'll pick it up. Mm -hmm. But Munoz goes through a series of reflections in this posthumously published mm -hmm. book about what Brown is in the world. And you've done something so literal, which is that you've painted things brown. Mm -hmm. And maybe you could start by telling us about the origin story of that decision. I asked myself a simple question after seeing several exhibitions around the United States. I was traveling to teach and uh, I went to several big museums and lots of really beautiful exhibitions in New York and Chicago and Dallas. And I asked myself uh, a very simple question. I'd seen a lot of uh, work made from repurposed object. They called it at that time post-production, where you actually chose something that was already produced and made it into art. And I saw this fabulous exhibition at the New Museum in the Bronx. Uh, and I'm sorry, not the Bronx, in the Bowery. And the whole place looked like it was made, the, uh, the whole exhibition looked like it was made from a crazy homeless person, a crazy genius homeless person. I couldn't believe it. All five floors or whatever was filled with trash made into objects. And I saw tons of work like this all over the nation. And I asked myself, which is always where I start, uh, what would... If I was to be an artist that used repurposed objects from my cultural point of view, which is the first time I ever asked myself that question, from my cultural point of view, what would it look like? And it took me five years to find the answer. I uh, scoured antique malls. I scoured secondhand stores. I, I scoured uh, CVS looking for objects that maybe I could make into art. I had no idea what was going to go there. Um, I found a bunch of stuff made by, you know, European, uh, Grecian, Roman objects that I could repurpose. It's everywhere. Egyptian stuff was every place. But I found no Mexican anything. I didn't find any Latin anything. Uh, maybe I found some salt shakers, salt and pepper shakers of lazy Mexicans with their hats. That's about as close as I got. And one day I went into the secondhand store and I found the, uh, after scouring and scouring and experimenting and making other objects of all different kinds, I did some, uh, what, uh, some, I did a, a series called Thugs and Hoes about sexuality in the 21st century. I did some stuff called Earth's Altar, which was basically putting the goddess back into the, the temple. And then one day I walked into the secondhand store and I found the Dick and Jane Primer 
see Dick run, see Jane play, see, it's a very, uh, you have to be over 50 to know what I'm talking about. It's this little book and everybody's got little red hair and blue eyes. Yeah, there you go. And you just gave yourself away. And, uh, you know, red hair, blue eyes, a little kid, a little blonde hair, blue eyes. And all of a sudden I just said, oh my God, I didn't really say, oh my God. I, I shouted an explicative, which I will not put here. Oh my God, I could paint them brown. I could just paint them brown. I'll just make them brown. And I looked at the store and there was all this stuff that I could just make brown. I said, I just want to make them all Mexican, like me. And therefore we have make them all Mexican became the first portfolio of work. And I went crazy and I bought $3,000 worth of pricing antiques, which are in my storage unit. You're welcome to take some if you want it. (laughs) And I painted everything brown and it just sort of hit me that I had a Q-tip or a little paintbrush with a little brown on it. And suddenly I was changing history, changing the entire narrative, changing uh, the structures of power. Uh, All the comedians became brown. All the cartoon figures became anything I could find, right, became brown. The politicians, the comedians, the the actors and actresses, all all the big guns, everybody became brown. And suddenly you have a new world. You have a new brown world. And suddenly we have a new place in the world. We're not invisible any longer. We're very visible. During my last uh, solo show, I had the honor of uh, uh, providing a tour of the show to Linda Ronstadt. And she stopped at the Elvis Presley, which is in this show, too. And I said, imagine if Elvis Presley had been Mexican, how that would have changed the, the rock and roll world. And she said, tell me about it. And so, you know, everything just became brown. And when I realized that brown was the sort of the the glue that held all the work together, then one portfolio just started rolling after another. And I could continue with this portfolio, but I really believe that Brown Baroque, Objects of Opulence, actually says it all pretty nicely in terms of drawing all four four portfolios together Mm -hmm. into one scenario, if you will. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've spent 12 years investigating brown, uh, working with brown. I have so much brown paint in my studio, I can't believe it. It's tubes and tubes and tubes of it. And uh, yeah, I've really enjoyed it. It's been wonderful. And it's been introspective. I've been able to think of myself. Mm-hmm. And I've been able to think about the broader community. I've been able to think about data and statistics as it relates to Latin Americans and where we are and where we've been, where we want to be, where we should be, all these things, where we're going to where we're going to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think sometimes when we use brown as a descriptor, and because you are from a Mexican-American family, there might be a perception that you're speaking to a Chicano experience, Chicana experience, Chicanx experience. Mm -hmm. And actually, I had some good conversations with students today who are in the MFA program about feeling a distance from, from that um, yeah. that framing, mm-hmm. which I think we've also spoken about. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. I want to pause for a moment. Mm-hmm. You said that you wanted to think about these objects from your cultural mm-hmm. background, from your point of view, your cultural point of view. And I want to be clear that that's not the same as, as perhaps a universalizing Chicano mm-hmm. point of view, if there is one even, mm-hmm. right? And so perhaps it's useful to describe a bit of how you grew up. Mm-hmm. And I don't want us to spend the whole hour doing that. We could spend a lot longer than that. Right. But you didn't just grow up here in mm-hmm. California. You tried traveled quite a bit and that forms part of your cultural point of view. Could you walk us quickly? I'll, walk you, I'll walk you quickly through. I was born in Boyle Heights uh, in a Chinese uh, hospital. Uh, There's now since been raised in basically a Jewish Mexican in- environment. Uh, my father was in UCLA at the time. He graduated when I was three years old in 1951 and became a commissioned officer in the United States Air Force. And we moved to Germany. I grew grew up with my grandmother and my great-grandmother. I had many great-grandparents and tons of cousins in East Los Angeles. And suddenly I was spirited off to Germany. I stayed there for two years. Then I came back to the United States and traveled to about 10 different states with my family. My father was an air command and staff. He was a pilot. He He was being stationed in several different places. And I ended up in um middle I ended up in Sacramento for seven years between se- second and seventh grade. And then I ended up in Montgomery, Alabama uh, for middle school during the, in the 1960s, uh, during the marches and the height of the Ku Klux Klan in its in, in its heyday when it was actually visible. You actually see the Ku Klux Klan it wasn't hidden. And then I went to Madrid, Spain for high school and part of college. 
and loved Europe a great deal. It was a, wonderful to get away from Alabama. It was really a harsh place. I think that's the bedrock of all this work is what I learned about color in that state during that time. And then I came back to L.A. to go to graduate school. And uh, here I am. Did you say Europe? Yeah, I was in Spain for about uh, total was, it, I guess, a total of about four years when I went to high school and college there and learned to speak Spanish and traveled Europe a great deal. I did Italy, did Portugal, did England, did my, well, I already did Germany, did a lot of Spain. Yeah. So I have like all these very varied experiences about what it means to be a brown person in the world. And I see myself really, the larger form for me is really Latina. I really see myself as a Latina, but I have uh, my brown intellectual property also contains Chicani Chicanismo, Chicanex, Latinx, Indigenex. You know, it's uh, it's I've traveled around the world. And so I have a lot of different I'm, I mix blood for a lot of different reasons. I think of that time in Europe also as being a time when you were doing you is some of the roots of research for you. Mm -hmm. Right. And so we've talked a lot about brown intellectual property in our conversations. Mm -hmm. And I I would love to hear how you are defining that for yourself. I've defined it in a way from what I understand. But how do you define what that is? Tell me how you define it first. I think that I, I think it's such an interesting concept. I think it's a synthesis of your life. I mean, I think it's a synthesis and it's very holistic. And I think in many ways you're coming out of a feminist mm -hmm. Uh, insistence that lived experience is intellectual property nice. and that that includes our bodies as well as our bibliographies, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And so when you are painting everything brown, um, it flattens the objects in a way, but also if you think about all the diversity of objects that you have in that space, they're pointing to this breadth of research and lived experience and domestic space and audience and community. And yeah, yeah. well, um, as an artist and my practice is really what they say, if you're going to write, you need to write what you know about, you know, for writers, I always say that, write what you know. And I think painters are, you know, should do the same. I think artists should do the same to come from what they know, what they've experienced, not necessarily only from what they've read or, you know, uh, watch from afar, you know, but something that's actually come from inside of them. And I've spent a great deal of time, what is it, the last 50 years, sort of ensconced in what is now, you know, Latinx, Chicanx, Indigenex. And I've collected a lot of memories and a lot of information, a lot of hopefully knowledge, a lot of experiences. And it behooves me as an artist to take that information, that intellectual property, and use it to consolidate an image. I'm um, obligated to do so mm -hmm. as an artist. That's how I feel about it. Mm -hmm. Were there things about the Munoz text that we talked about or that are in this this essay that were that resonated with you? There were so many questions. Okay. There were so many questions about how do you experience Brown? What is Brown? How is Brown perceived? <laughs> is Brown perceivable? Uh -huh. Is Brown understandable? Uh -huh. Is Brown in, uh, invisible? There were so many questions. It really sent my head on a big spin. Your essay just, uh, I, I probably won't sleep for the rest of the year. <laughs> I mean, there's only a few weeks left, right? Oh, there. I know. <laughs> but, you know, I'll be a wreck by New Year, right? You know, it was... Uh, the idea that Brown could actually be questioned so deeply mm -hmm. that the experience of Brown, that my experience of Brown, of your experience of me as Brown, uh, experience of Brown from the outside, experience from Brown on the inside, it was really quite amazing. Mm -hmm. It became a philosophical treatise mm -hmm. rather than just a color that you're painting on an object. Mm -hmm. It was like a state of being, but what was that being? And so I've had to ask myself several questions about how I feel about myself as a brown person. And I'm hoping that during our Q&A, you all might ask questions or actually share your experience of brownness as well. Because it seems as if it's it's varied and it can be seen and perceived in multiple ways, which I, I really like. Because, mm -hmm. you know, we think about white people as being very complicated, but brown people not being so complicated somehow or another. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Right. They're the ones with the intellect, with the understanding and the travel, right? And we're just kind of, well, trying to figure it out. I think it's much better. I think it's much deeper than that. Mm -hmm. I think all colors have that same. We could ask the same questions about white. We could ask the same questions about red, right? 
we could ask the same questions about mixed race. And that's really coming up for a lot of people in the United States as, you know, intermarriage and all this good stuff. When my husband and I got married uh, 47 years ago, we couldn't, we weren't, we, he's, he's a Anglo-American. We couldn't rent an apartment. <laughs> I mean, it's real. This is, you know, the struggle is real. Yes. One of the things that I really like about that Munoz is that he's not just thinking about celebrating brownness, uh -huh. that he's really kind of thinking about the complexity of lived experience, the uh -huh. complexity of perception. Right. Um, and that one of the things he says is that brownness often implies a devaluing. That's right. Right. Um, not that he's arguing that brownness is about devaluing, but that it implies socially yeah. that something is devalued right. if it's browned. Yes. And I was struck by your decision to buy expensive antiques that you would prefer to keep in your house and live with, let's be honest, Yeah. and painting them brown. Because you also said, I have a lot of guilt about making this less valuable. That's right. Although then it moves into an, uh, an art museum and an art market and, <laughs> and acquires a different value, right? So there is this movement across like what is valuable when, where, and why, who gets to say what's uh -huh. valuable, for example. Uh -huh. Um, can you talk about value mm -hmm. and brownness? Well, I, I think that there's many ways to look at value and brownness in the sense that uh, I don't believe that there's a brown person in our audience today that hasn't felt devalued as a brown person. I don't think that's possible. I know that my experience, you know, where you, you're afraid that someone's looking down at you because you're brown. Um, they're not going to see you, but you can raise your hand for me if you want to. I know I felt it. It's real. You're always worried that maybe you're not being considered seriously or understood because you're different, right? That someone's always thinking something about you that you're not sure about. Um, I've said in public before that uh, in families, uh, Latin American families, uh, the women who are the darkest are left to take care of the parents. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that are seen that won't be married. Look at, I'm getting shakings of heads out there. Yes, sir, we know this. They're made to be the maids and to be left behind to take care of the elderly parents or the small children. And the light colored girls are allowed education and better marriages. They're the ones that are held out to be married to more wealthy and affluent men, mm -hmm. right? I mean, this is this is hard. This is hard to take. It's hard to talk about. Mm -hmm. It's hard to think about that there's a devaluation of the color from within the community as well as from without. Oh. Um, I've always said that in my own experience that I don't think people take have taken me seriously a lot because I am brown. Mm -hmm. That they underestimate my capacities and my abilities. And I think many people have that experience, too. Um, being a person of color in the world today isn't an easy thing. There's a big struggle going on with the, the communities of color that are now raising in numbers and raising in education and raising in status. And there's actually a struggle going on, a power struggle. It's a very large power struggle. I think we see it, right? And it's really about where you stand in that struggle or how you how you stand in the struggle, you know. Um, there's some, we're growing in education and growing in status in terms of income, but we're still invisible in a lot of ways. And a lot of structures, social structures, want us to remain invisible. Mm -hmm. And so here I am making it very visible, putting it all the way out, and even usurping a lot of positions you know, within the little figurines and the little things. So just basically you're us usurping power, which makes some people very nervous mm -hmm. on both sides. You know, you can feel this sort of within the community, you get a little nervous because you're not used to that. Are we really allowed to go over there? Can we really do that? Right. And on the outside, it's kind of like, so what gives you the right to do that? You can't do that. Uh, they had a video. There was a video for my solo at La Plaza de Cultura y Artes. And it went viral on on in French television. And you should have seen uh, the hits on that. I didn't even I was too afraid to respond to some of it because it was really volatile. It was on fire. And it was these questions. Exactly. How do you value brown? Do you value brown? Can you value, you know, the variations of us, the differences in us? And as artists, all of the artists here, because I, I know there's lots of artists here, we all dress differently. 
right? We are used to this, these kinds of questions in terms of valuation of who we are as people because we're artists and kind of different. And that kind of fits in the same way. Did I answer your question? Of course. <laughs> I didn't know. Maybe I did. Of course you did. I am, I, as I've been thinking about this work, I am struck by the, the kind of settings that you've created, the, the interior, what I call the interiors, right? right? That you're creating small rooms, even very small rooms, kind of maquettes of small rooms. Um, and this has a long, I think, lineage in feminist artistic practice. Yeah. Um, but also there's something very interesting to me as someone who works in museums to think about putting a living room in a museum. Mm. Um, because it shifts kind of where you're at a little bit, right? There's a little bit of a disorienting mm -hmm. feeling to mm -hmm. coming in and seeing a living room mm -hmm. in a museum. Mm -hmm. And it, to me, that, that thing about place yeah. is tied to value, but the thing about place mm -hmm. is really interesting. And so we've, I, I can, I write about period rooms. If you don't know period rooms in, in big un, quote unquote universal museums like the Met oh, yeah. um, or the Brooklyn Museum or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, often donors and patrons will donate things from their homes. Um, often the founding women of those museums will donate things that they've had in their homes or their communities. Mm -hmm. And the museums not quite knowing what to do with them, uh, create these rooms that perhaps are, you know, a, a living room from 1836 in Salem, Massachusetts, right? Mm -hmm. And so you can go in and see a kind of fantasy world mm -hmm. of, oh. of this living room. I, I love these living rooms. I'm so fascinated by them as fictions, right? And mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. Um, you wanted to talk about the fiction of authenticity yes. that, that, that riffs on, like, what does it mean? That those living rooms are all of white women's homes. Mm -hmm. And what does it mean if you make a living room that's brown? And what is the fiction that's, that you're playing with here? Well, you know, when you talk about the period rooms, when you talk about period films, yeah. when you talk about anything that takes, you know, like creates a, a scenario out of history, uh, I would say that there's a great deal of fiction involved mm -hmm. that uh, we don't really know what life was like in these in these 18th century or 19th century rooms. We kind of have these disparate objects that are sort of s spread around, but we really don't know how people lived. We don't really know how people thought or how they communicated or what was valued. We just have these empty rooms with these objects that have like little labels on them that say, well, you know, this is this year and this is made of this and this is made of that. But it really doesn't tell us what what the authentic experience was, what it is as an authentic fiction. It's not real. Is there an authentic experience? Not in not. I don't think in here there is mm -hmm. unless you dig really deep on your own level of understanding what brown is for you. Then it mm -hmm. becomes authentic. Hmm. But like someone said to me about my the my vignettes, the brown polka dot and the, all that stuff, and I can go through how those came about. Everything that I do is arbitrary. I think nobody understands that it's very arbitrary. I find it, it works, I use it. I don't question it, I don't ask it, I just do it. Hmm. I find it, I go, wow, that's kind of interesting, that's funky, that's really messed up. Hmm. I don't use the word messed up, I actually use the... The, this explicative that is really messed up let's use it <laughs> oh i like that that's really stupid let's use that um i don't uh the idea of uh there's the, the fiction of authenticity goes so deep for me those words just resonated so hard for me because the the authentic experience, the authentic brown experience, the fi the fiction of the authentic experience, the fiction of the authentic brown experience, the the fiction the fiction of the authenticity of what the world thinks about the brown experience, what the world thinks about brown history, what the world thinks about the about brown uh, uh, the 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 contribution. It's all it's this it's it's all a story that's everyone made up. And I mean, we're even talking about it now with AI, right? The computer thinks it knows all about us, but what it spits out is really ridiculous. And what it spits out is what people have written about us, this great fiction of the authentic brown life, the authentic life of a movie star. There's one for you. We all know this. The fiction of authenticity of a movie star's life. If you know what a movie star's life, it is not, definitely not what you see on the screen. You can scroll right through it, but it's not. That's not it. And it's kind of like thinking about the authentic, the authentic brown life. What does that mean? And the fiction of it is what other people think it means. 
Even some of us live by the fiction of what is that authenticity to us? What does it mean to be African-American in the United States? There are so many fictions about that. There are so many lies told about that. And we can swallow all of them. What does it mean to be a Mexican-American in the United States today? If you ask that question, I mean, you just had an open mic on the street. Can you imagine the fiction of authenticity that you would hear? It'd be it'd be incredible a uh, number of lies. Artwork, and especially in this, I mean, I'm building this scenario, what we call vignettes, these scenarios that are another portal to this fiction of authenticity. What is it? And as I said, I don't think that I don't have an answer for it. I have a lot of information and I know what I like when I see it. Doesn't that sound funky? That's what collectors say. I know what I like when I see it. Uh, and I use it. But my experience of what it means to be brown is decidedly different from every brown person in this room. I know it. We might have some crossings and some places to go, but the true story of the true answer of what it means to be brown has to be shared from multiple vantage points. And that's what I like about this idea, the fiction of authenticity. Mm -hmm. We live, some, many of us live in this fiction of authenticity. Mm -hmm. And you have to ask yourself about your work. Is this authentic? Am I just making this stuff up? What is it that really I'm offering to the audience? What does it say about me? What do I want it to say about me? These are important questions for an artist to ask themselves, no matter what they're painting or producing from any point of view. How authentic is the work? Are you living a fiction? I mean, you could go on forever with this allegory. It's amazing. Did I answer your question? <laughs> um, Mary, will you flag me when we have about 15 minutes left? I I left my clock oh, over there. Yeah, is that okay? Yeah. I just realized I don't want to keep us too long, but I, I lost track of time. We're doing good. Okay. Um, you said, uh, I'm going to pin you down. <laughs> pin me down. <laughs> Um, you said that your process is arbitrary. It is. And that you just, arbitrary. no, I'm going to fight you in this. Um, and, <laughs> and that you, you have a feeling about a thing and then it becomes the work. And we, we talked about this actually with, with embodied forms of research. I mean, it's so funny to me that we're talking about fiction and authenticity, the fiction of authenticity alongside a very research driven practice. Data. Yeah. Data. You have a huge amount of research in yeah. this show. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I, why do you have research if, I mean, like, how are you thinking about that tension between research and data or facts, even <laughs> sacred data, as you call it? Um, alongside these fictions of lived experience. You know, I have a total answer for you. Mm. I believe in uh, juxtaposing research and uh, mm. incongruous elements, incongruous topics. As an artist, that's where I get most of my ideas. Mm. Uh, right now, uh, you know, I'm doing uh, Jack Kerouac. What does that have to do with the Chicano experience? It has a lot to do with it. If you're able to draw multiple threads across the fiction, mm -hmm. right? So if I ask myself, okay, I'm going to read Jack Kerouac, which I'm doing, I'm reading his biography. I'm looking through all of his books. I love them. I didn't think I would. I didn't think I would, but I love them. I'm, do I'm doing Dharma bums right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. Love Dharma bums. It's driving me crazy. And uh, so what art object could possibly come out of Dharma bums? Believe me, I'll figure it out. And it'll happen arbitrarily. All of a sudden, one day I'll wake up and I go, ah, oh, that's how it fits in. It's like this puzzle part that you can't find. Mm -hmm. And that's how a lot of it is like, OK, so you're going through a you're going through an antique mall and you find something. You go, well, maybe that'll work. It's not too expensive. It's pretty nice. Let's let's just buy this. It's the whole process is it has to be arbitrary as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. If you're too specific about what you're making, if you're if you see it so clearly and so pointedly, mm -hmm. you, you're going to run out of creativity pretty quickly. You're going to find yourself repeating yourself. But if you juxtapose incongruous information, incongruous study, incongruous practices, along with this focus on, on uh, what process, you're going to come up with odd solutions to uh, uh, complex questions about topics that you're interested in, whether it's a feminist topic, whether it's a cultural topic, whether it's socio-political, you're going to come up with these weird solutions. And uh, that's why it's arbitrary. Hmm. Like, you know, Elvis, I did Elvis because I could buy him. It isn't like I said, oh, I have to do Elvis. I found him in a store. I said, oh, well, Elvis. <laughs> yeah, why not? Let's do Elvis. Somebody said, oh, you should do Frank. I go, well, find him for me. I can't do Frank unless you find him for me. 
you you have to do what you get and you make art out of what you've got right and so it's all arbitrary all of it's arbitrary for me when you say arbitrary do you mean you aren't starting out with the answer i never have an answer Uh uh-huh that's what i thought i have no answer but there are there is a consistency to your questions and they're they're built on a a a very impressive career over many decades of data research of of research so i did all this data work i did all this data work I was I was I was just kind of doing a student thing where all of a sudden I found myself on Statista and I found myself on all these data sites, mm. incongruous juxtapositions of information. I didn't know what I was doing. I just found it interesting. Wow. Did you know this? Wow. It's like a you know, like conversation. I became very interesting in public, mm. the spouting stuff. Right. And all I had in my head, I asked myself a question. I said, I had this uh, George Lawson, this wonderful dealer in in uh, Culver City, loved Make Them All Mexican. He went crazy for Mexico, Make Them All Mexican. And he had a gallery where he focused on abstract painters. But all of a sudden, George wanted to do Make Them All Mexican because he thought it was genius. I'm not going to fight with anybody who calls me a genius. Let's have a show. I'm not going to do that, right? And then after the show was over, uh, George wanted to go back to showing his abstract painters. And I thought, oh, I love George. I want to stay with his gallery. This is really great. I wonder what would happen if I was a minimalist. What would happen if I was a minimalist? (laughs) And so all I had was a color brown and data. And the only thing I could come up with, because I saw a lot of minimalists, I started looking at Mondrian and stuff like this. I came up with a brown circle. All I had in my head was this brown circle and a bunch of data on a table. Totally arbitrary stuff. One day I walked in the art store and I found architectural grid paper and I went, oh my God, which is really, you know, MFS. I could put the data in brown dots on this stuff over here. And I went home like a maniac. I bought a bunch of paper and some markers and I went home and I made that. It was completely, it was like all of us, it's like finding an Easter egg when you're a kid. You don't really know what Easter is. But you know, everybody's out in the grass and there's something in there that you're looking for and there's prizes and candies. You just, you know, it's there. You don't really know what the holiday is. Who knows what this holiday is? What are we doing here? Oh, there's candy. I'll go look. And suddenly you find this answer and then you make a whole body of work around it. That's the answer, really. Mm. When you find it, you just make 20 pieces. You make 50. What I do, make 100? I made 100 pieces. Let's make 100. A nice round number. It, it, the creative process, there has to be an arbitrary aspect to it or else you just, you'll never be creative. You'll just create the same image over and over again. That's how I come up with multiple series of works and why I always have new ideas. Hmm. Yeah. It's a dangerous place to be. <laughs> because, you know, it could turn into a flop. You could end up making a, you know, a mess. Hmm. What do you want your viewer? What do you want to have happen for your viewers in this show? Oh, I want them to be self-reflective as human beings. Just want them to look at themselves, look at others, <clears throat> think about their feelings about each other. Mm. Uh, you know, be honest with themselves about how they feel about themselves and about each other. That's all. I just want them. To, I want. I want. I, I'd like a humanistic experience to come out. Some people think this work is hilarious. Some people think this work is hyper political, right? And some people think that uh, it's meant for you know portals into human experience. Personalized human experience comes out of it a lot of times. People start telling their stories. Some people get very angry. Boy, believe me, I've had to put up with a lot. Some people start crying. Introspection. You know, an individual who isn't capable of self reflection isn't really capable of uh, communicating with the world. It's a humanistic ex- it's a humanistic experience. I'm sharing from the interior of myself, and I'm asking you to take a look at yourself as well and to look at your neighbor, to look at the person sitting next to you, to look at the person you're working with and see each other in a human way. Hmm. Are you asking that through the data? Is that the, the point at which many of your viewers find themselves? Well, the, the data surprises everybody. Mm-hmm. They'll say things like, I didn't know that. I go, yeah, I know. Nobody does. Uh, we'll be 30% of the United States population Latinos in 2050. We'll be 30% of the population, right? 30% of all USC students are UC students. Uh, 36% were Latinos, the entrance first time in history, 2020. It's a good thing to know, but then there's also not such good data. We're under 10% in all the, um, uh, all the professions, doctors, lawyers, we need to know more about ourselves. 
That's what I found when I said, I'm going to look at data from a brown point of view. I've broken out now and look at data from a lot of different points of view. I study data from all different sectors and all different understandings of the world. And maybe that'll lead into some other objects as well. Hmm. I just fell in love with the data and it, and it tracks so easy. I could track it and make data pictographs. They seem very interesting. People really like them. I thought they were pretty insightful and artistic hmm. and I enjoyed making them. It's enough, right? Mm -hmm. I spent an afternoon with the MF, several MFA students. Thank yeah. you so much. It was really like such a joy today. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm going to ask you to give them some advice, but you know, alongside this data question, as a brown artist, what we've one of the things we've talked about is that you've had to build your own archive, right? You haven't waited around for some institution to come find you, although they are finding you now finally yeah. um, in many ways, and they always have kind of found you because you're you're good at connecting with many institutions. Uh -huh. But you have done this really. I had another scholar tell me, Linda's. What, I tell every artist to look at what Linda does in terms of professional practices because she's built this website that is a, a tremendous archive of the work and so there's actually two websites now and um you can find all of this kind of history as a scholar it's fantastic you can find all of her history and archives and exhibitions and images and titles and um and so that's a long way around saying you've had to also collect your own information so people can find you right i wonder if there are other bits of advice you might offer to artists who are just coming out into the world in terms of of um Persisting. Persisting. Mm -hmm. um, growing, expanding, sharing, communicating, right? Reaching out, making friends, making colleagues, having opportunities, being invited for opportunities, creating more, making sure the world sees it, making sure the world understands it. Um, a lot of there's a very large myth around being an artist and uh, artists don't understand that cordial, friendly, informative, professional communications with curators, with historians, with scholars, with educators, right, with museum and university professionals is actually possible that you can actually make friends, develop relationships and reach out and garner invitations to share your work. It's a normal part of the practice. If you are friendly and kind and professional and prepared, you can always find someone who's interested in your work. Inviting people to your studio is a very is very much part of the practice <clears throat> and you mustn't be afraid of that. Reaching out, communicating, sharing the work, not sitting back and waiting for the world to discover you. It doesn't happen. That's not how it happens. You'll end up in your studio with tons of stuff and nobody to look at it. You have to offer opportunities for people to share, to, to exhibit your work, to publish your work, to invite you to speak, to invite you to present. And it's all just based on cordial communications, friendly communications. I learned one really important thing is that 80% of your communications with curators and scholars and educators and gallerists and uh, directors is in writing. 80%. And 20% is face-to-face -face in your studio or at your show. Hmm. Most people think you're supposed to talk to them live at their opening. And you always get somebody who's not very happy about that. And it causes a lot of problems because you feel uncomfortable and they feel because that's 80% is in writing. And nowadays we have email and we have uh, Instagram and we have LinkedIn and we have publications and we have outreach. Mm -hmm. And so don't be, don't be shy, but be brief, <laughs> be brief and let your work speak for itself. Mm -hmm. uh, the image and the concept is king and queen, no doubt about it. It is the most important thing of all is, the, is the, the complexity of the object itself is king and queen. 
Is this a good time for Q&A? This is probably a good time to get yeah. the questions. And I'm going to be a hog and start. Oh, goody. What usually is my problem, where it becomes more of a statement than a question. But I want to also kind of question this notion of arbitrariness yeah. because there's so much continuity between the bodies of work. In particular, we can see in the, in, in the installation here that how the Datos Sagrados, the Brown Dot Project, and make them all Mexican have kind of all fit in so nicely, um, which I think, you know, may feel arbitrary, but there's so much honesty and thought in what goes into what you're making that, that it is um, sort of non-arbitrary. Um, and I had two things I wanted to ask you. One was a kind of a follow-up on this notion about graduate students, but I know when you were in graduate school, kind of comparable to the time that John put to see Smith went to school. I know she's older than you, but she went late. Um, there was this tendency to want to have women, and particularly women of color, be thought of strictly as people who were going to graduate if they did with a grad degree to become a teacher. Mm -hmm. And did you feel was were you given that kind of pressure, or did you feel like there was this sense that you weren't going to be a real artist? Was that like a what a struggle that made you kind of even a stronger artist? Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, do you see the personality that's here? <laughs> do you see me? Do you, do you see me? I have not changed. People who knew me in high school go, oh, yeah, that's Linda. <laughs> this is it. And I've always been like this. And I've always been very centered about what I've wanted. And I really haven't wavered very much. Uh, this is what I've wanted. This is what I've done. And it's basically been this way since about 14 you know, and uh, when I was in grad school, I was uh, married. I just I got married my last year in grad school. And I was told if you're going to be a serious artist, you can't get married. You can't have kids. And I just said, <laughs> I'm not going to be lonely. I'm not going to be that artist. I'm not going to be that lonely artist and some seller out there. I know what's going to happen and I don't want it. I know what's out there. I'm not doing that. And I got married and I had kids. And I'm married with children, and I'm very happy about that. When I graduated with my MFA, I wanted to teach. I love teaching. I love being with students. It means a lot to me. I like sharing information, and I enjoy the you know working through the process with people. I really like that. But there was no women of color in the in the in the colleges and the universities at that point. When I applied and tried to teach, I was run out of town. There was no place for me. I taught, uh, uh, Judy Baca gave me her position mm -hmm. at UCI for a year and a half. And I did teach a little bit in some of the community colleges, but I was just run out of town every time. I wasn't given a chance to teach. Mm -hmm. I would have liked to have te taught. I was also invited to be a part of the nonprofit arena. And I said, nah, it's really awesome. and I'm kind of grateful for all of it because basically it just pushed me back in the studio. Just pushed me right back in the studio, which is a harder place to be. It's much harder to be there, but you know, I love a good fight. <laughs> yes, uh, a comment or question. I really enjoyed your uh, it's a man being brown, the one song being brown. Yeah, I want to uh, ask your, your opinion about how you would say to deliver authentic uh, uh stories yeah. the brown families. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Present. The flash, the mom was white and the mother was Mexican. Yeah. Terminated. Later, so I think it's solid. It was the uh, first five minutes I learned for a smash the top. So it's pretty marked for brown population. Even blue people. Clearly, marked for yeah, yeah. brown population, but it's a thought of thoughts all over. Yeah. That's why we were talking about the fiction of authenticity. Mm -hmm. We're talking about it again. People misinterpret what it is. Well, Matt, well, you know what it is. I mean, do you really think Mexican Americans or brown people are actually writing the scripts? Do you think the people who are that are writing the scripts have any brown experience at all? I mean, maybe they interview somebody. Maybe <laughs> they even kind of decide that what the brown people want, right? They kind of decide. Well, you know, we'll get more because we, we do this. So it's it's all fiction, and it doesn't really work that well. It, do, it doesn't really work that well. And, and unfortunately, we're as people of color, we're asked to live within the within the milieu of the fiction of authenticity everywhere we go. 
It's, it's not really the black experience. It's not really the gay experience. It's not really the brown experience. It's not really the woman's experience. It's just what these other people make up that we're supposed to think, oh, that, that, that looks like me. Maybe I'll go there. But it doesn't work. It just doesn't work again and again and again and again. It doesn't work. Hollywood's pretty much, you know, uh, I don't know what happened. I think they thought that they put out some black uh, artists and that that would make the experience more authentic. But I don't know if it's really done that either. Did I answer your question? Uh, I like that question a lot, Richard, too, because you started with a study of media. I mean, I think some of your, uh, the way you describe your awareness of absence and of misrepresentation uh, and of false authenticities yeah. comes out of looking at media first, right? Mm -hmm. And saying, well, why is the why is it Dick and Jane that are always white? And what if we make them all Mexican? Right? Like that was the question. It came out of media studies in a way for you. And so I I, you know, that's that's a starting point, I think, for a lot of this work. I think it came around the other way. Oh, okay. I think it came around the other way and I ended up there. Mm -hmm. I really wasn't thinking about anything except for how do I use these plastic cups that I got at CVS to talk about my cultural experience. I mean, that's that's as, uh, as arbitrary as it was. You know, I was looking at suction cups. What can I do with suction cups? Well, that doesn't have anything to do with the brown experience. I mean, it was so odd. It's, mm -hmm. it's confusing to me. And as delving into the, the words fictional authenticity, it just blows your brain away. Like, mm -hmm. I dare you, go into CVS and see if you can figure out how to make an art object out of something. <laughs> and to make it according to your color. Right. A, a, a cultural experience. Then as soon as I started it and started going around and started collecting photographs and postcards, of course, I'm going to find movie stars. And I was making brown, too. Mm. Oh, well, let's, oh, let's make them brown, too. Oh, well, we'll do that, too. We'll just make that brown. Fine. Make that brown. <laughs> and all of a sudden you're talking about politics. You're talking about history. You're talking about mathematics. You're talking about data. You're talking about inclusion in Hollywood. You're talking about all kinds of stuff, which you had no idea because you all you had in your head was, you know, suction cups at CBS. You kind of discovered it kind of unfolds unto itself. And the only glue that you have is I'm going to make the whole world brown. I'm just make them all everything brown. I've thought about painting my whole body brown. I've thought about painting your whole body brown. And, you know, I could go on and on and on forever with this stuff. And who knows? It would then we would have different conversations about feminism and about the body and about, the, you know, mm -hmm. how we perceive our bodies and the brown body. And it just the conversation goes on forever. It's funny when you think about it, it's just a bucket of paint. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So oh, as I put it, like I said to myself, you know, I a lot of times don't know what I'm doing. I mean, I know what I'm doing. I know I've got to go there. I know when I see it, I know what it is. But I rely on educators, curators mm. to tell me more about the work. Mm. That's why I'm so fascinated by what you wrote, because I'm going, I never thought about it like that. It uncovers itself. It becomes something else. And to me, that's our that's 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 when important work happens. When there's so many levels to it that you can't decipher them all. There's no way to do it. Okay. What other questions you all have? Yeah. Oh goody. Uh, first of all, thank you. Uh -huh. I still enjoy your work. Thank yeah, you. I love your camera. Mm -hmm. um, tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. Thank you. Um, but I have a couple of questions. One is not only about your work and bodies of labor in terms of appropriation, but I'm also really curious how you think about appropriation in terms of like a modern lexicon yeah. and how that really speaks to mm -hmm. a bigger vocabulary mm -hmm. of work, mm -hmm. not just in the United States, mm -hmm. but around the world. Yeah, yeah. And then with that, I can shake what it is. When you talk about editions and why you don't um, think about editions, how you think about other people's work that becomes editions, like how I Did you say oh, editions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll start with the first last. I'll start with the second question first. Okay. I have a master's degree in printmaking. Yeah. And I never really made editions, I always made monotypes. <laughs> my additions were like 10 that's that's all i could stand was 10 you know i wasn't into 120 150 i've done silk screens you know as a serographs with a master printer where i've had additions of 110 but i always did monotypes i even did monotypes and built sculpture off of the monotypes that i made i had a whole series of those 
And, and I love my, I just love monotypes. They were like painting on stone. That's what I loved. I think additions are very valuable for artists mm -hmm. who want to make a regular living from producing multiples. Multiples are a very good way to be able to make a sale a week, make two sales a week at a reasonable price to uh, collectors who are, you know, uh, working, you know, they're working people who would like something be of beauty and an in individual work in their house. I think multiples can be very useful in terms of spreading a very uh, a widespread word about a concept or an idea that you might have. But nowadays that we have social media and we have the computer, I'm kind of like, why would I bother doing multiples? I have a few multiples. I end up giving them away for uh, auctions and for gifts to people. That's what I end up doing with them because I really like the individual object. What was the first question again? It was about uh, appropriation. Oh, yeah. It's not just in your own yeah. process. Yeah. Your own, you know, vocabulary, but how it also speaks to the broader context. Yeah, um, I think it's important that we start reusing stuff that we've already got. I mean, there's an environmental aspect to it. Mm -hmm. To make art out of stuff that's already been made and just sitting around are going to be destroyed. Reuse. What is that? Reuse. Reduce, reuse, reduce. Yeah, yeah, reuse, reduce in art. So, you know, reusing objects makes a lot of sense to me in terms of making the new object. Mm -hmm. uh, the transformation of the used object is a big, is a, is, is a, a, a nice uh, a, a, a vault of thought to go into. Like if you just go into that and allow the arbitrariness of your thoughts to take you to the object, I think that's really wonderful. I think there's a feminist aspect to it, to a, mm. to uh, to reuse something. I think the idea of uh, turning something into something else is a magical process that can really take your brain and blow it away. And I really love that about art when something just appears like these vignettes. They just I, I didn't know what they were going to look like until Mary was kind enough to invite me to put them here. I said, well, I think I have this idea to do this and I wanted to do this and I don't know what it looks like. And I found out what it looked like when I looked at it. I said, oh, there it is. Hi, I, I know what you are now. I, it was arbitrary. Let's put it up. It was in my head, but who knows? And then, of course, appropriation is a very old word used in the indigenous community. Hmm. Yeah. We've had so much stuff appropriated. My Lord, have mercy on us. And so I thought, I'm just going to appropriate your ass back. <laughs> <laughs> really, it was that fun. It was that ridiculous. I'm just going to appropriate it back. You steal my stuff, I'm going to steal yours. Ha, ha, ha. Not only am I going to steal, I'm going to appropriate it, but I'm going to, do, I'm going to destroy it. And that's part of what she was talking about. Is sometimes I buy a really beautiful object, like a true Victorian object. I'm going, I don't know. It's such a great object. I don't know if I could destroy this. And sometimes I go, ah. I take out my gun and I just blow it away. Let's just appropriate it. So there's a political aspect to it. My indigeneity is really about like, a, you know, I, I remember many years ago, I went into a exhibition in uh, Washington, D.C. at the Natural History Museum, and I saw all this appropriated uh, Alaskan mm. artifacts. I just sat down on the bench and cried. I just cried. I couldn't stop crying because I thought, how many people, how many families were destroyed to have these objects? How many of these objects were actually sacred to a home that were basically just ripped out of people's houses and just as how much of this stuff was stolen? And I just sat down and I wept. My family was embarrassed for me. I couldn't stop it, just weeping and weeping. Same thing happened to me in Hawaii. So it's kind of like retribution for me in a way, like this a, a, a political rep, retri, retribution for me. And then it's a creative process as well. And so it kind of fit, it kind of like the arbitrariness of it, it fit. Like when I sat, well, I could just appropriate all this stuff. Somehow or another, there was something in my soul that understood this and needed it. And I said, oh, I got to follow this. Let's go here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you, when you see the object, you go, that's it. I did it. You know that, right? Mm -hmm. There it is. I did it. And that's, that's, that's what I mean when I say arbitrary. You don't really know what it is until you see it. Mm -hmm. You can imagine it. Do you like that? Yeah. Yeah. It's fun to uh, appropriation. I call it reappropriation. <laughs> Anybody else? Ask me anything. I'll tell you the truth. <laughs>
Okay, well, there's one. Yes, there's yeah, one. Yeah, um, let's go so for it. I see that like you do a lot of my dollar works within the business. What are the connections between that? Yeah, well, I was doing the data on uh, the architectural grid paper, and basically I was plotting dots to signify actual data. So if there was a thousand squares on a piece of paper, and I was signifying that 30 percent of the United States will be Latino in 2050, then 300 of those squares were dotted. And I was dotting them in, you know, different architectural forms and abstract forms that look like weavings and blankets. And then they became looking like objects. And then they became looking like faces where I was just dotting. Mm -hmm. And then one day, very arbitrarily, I walked into the art store, which I get most of my ideas at the, art, at the store. Mm -hmm. I love to shop. <laughs> That's the great thing about this work. You get to shop a lot. It's really kind of funny. But then you have to spend money, which is really scary. So I walked into the art store and I saw circular handmade paper from India, Punjab paper. And I said, oh, my God, MFS. I could plot this data on circular paper. And because of my indigenous background, I see a lot of things in mandalic form. But they look like, you know, the beautiful tiled plaza that Michelangelo designed in the uh, Vatican. They look like mandalic forms of, uh, of the Tibetans and the sand paintings of the Native Americans in the Southwest. They look like ceremonial gatherings of all kinds all over the world. And so, again, I saw it and I said, oh, that has, that has a center for me. That makes sense for me. I understand that. And it just it just clicked and so I bought a whole bunch of paper and went home and started drawing. Mm -hmm. And so it's just another way of showing the data. But once again, it was this mm -hmm. unusual, maybe the word arbitrary isn't the correct word, mm -hmm. but to me, it's the only word I can come up with where it's just, I'm in the creative process, I'm in the store and I get an idea. Maybe it's subversive. Subversive. That's a good word. It's like reappropriation. Well, what's wrong with subversive? I like subversive. Well, let's get back to your first question. How was the 60s? <laughs> Subversive. That's for over drinks. That's for over drinks. <laughs> Any other questions before we? Okay, there you go. So I noticed um, in your management, your show here, you have some like very purposeful like, like aspects to your which which would you speak up for me please i, I didn't i think i missed it miniatures yes um, the white aspect that seems very first like purposeful uh -huh. um i was curious to what your thought process on that like the little white sculpture yeah the little white god the little white book the little white god the little white book yeah last mm -hmm. had like photographs that weren't um, changed there were some photographs that were not changed. They weren't made brown. The, the photograph, the little pictures were made brown. I made sure to make all the people in that room brown. But it's funny because, you know, that one vignette that you're talking about, the little miniature, I can't remember what the date is. Maybe you remember, Mary. Uh, something like, uh, something really incredible, like 96% of all Latinos believe that the United States is the best place to live. And if you look, if you look at that little uh, miniature, there's like a painting on the wall that's another Dato Sagrado, so a circular one, and that actually has the data in it, the 96 percent. So I decided to give them the American dream. <laughs> I said, they think that's a great, I'm going to give them the modern room. I'm going to give them the modern furniture. I'm going to give them what they perceive as this fiction, mm -hmm. this fiction of the American dream, right? With all the modernism. And then I decided to leave them their white gods because we've been you know we've been made to appropriate white gods we've been made to take them on we have to believe in the white gods so i said okay you can have your white gods and furniture and your guitar and your little white book everything will be fine yeah well uh, you know when you have white and brown and that's actually one of your points is that it's either white or brown in this particular case which is kind of oxymoronic kind of oxymoronic i didn't mean it to happen it was definitely arbitrary. Sometimes when you make something brown, you can see the whiteness, mm -hmm. right? Yes. It's made visible. Mm -hmm. And often we don't want to make it visible because it's a system of power. No. Um, but we have to acknowledge who we are and where no, we come from. Course, yeah. No, but you know, it's yeah. it's real. Mm -hmm. um, the, the structures mm -hmm. that we live in, the realities that we're asked to navigate are based mm -hmm. on a certain set of historical, what's religious, uh, monetary, you know, systems that were not built by us, per se. 
And we're asked to live in that and to survive within that. So we have to know it, mm-hmm. whether we like it or not. It's it's the structure that we live in and mm-hmm. we have to be comfortable in that. You know, you have to be comfortable in that. Allow that to be as it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's good. That's another... Great. <laughs> okay. Thank you all so much. Thank yeah, you. thank you both so much. <laughs> I'm here if you want to ask me. I'm here if you want to ask me something personally. Please don't hesitate. If you want to ask me something personally, I'm here. Thank you. Thank you.